Welcome to Voices for Change 2.0, the only podcast that focuses on mental health while mixing in movies, music, books, sports, and pop culture. Here are your hosts, Rebecca and Joe Lombardo. Hey, good morning and welcome to Voices for Change 2.0. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We are really excited to have an amazing and inspiring guest with us this, us this morning. She is an author, an advocate, a mom, and a survivor, not to mention a social media mogul. Please welcome to the show today, Rachel Thompson. Hi, everybody, and thanks for having me this morning. Hey. Hey, thanks. Thank, thank you for being here. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Yes. Yes, thank you for getting up early on this beautiful Saturday morning to uh, to join us. Uh, uh, no before problem. We get, before <laughs> we get started, do you have any questions for us? No, I'm good. I have to uh, compliment you. You've done such a wonderful job of promoting this podcast. So um, kudos to you. Oh, thank you. And com- <laughs> that means a lot coming from you. I I I uh, I, I I kind of take cues from from you what honey I mean, just the rubbing of the hands oh not that sorry i was rubbing my hands together and apparently my husband doesn't want me to do that so <laughs> <laughs> we'll just we'll just move on but anyway i was trying to say i have a lot of respect for you and everything that you've been able to accomplish so that com- that means uh, a lot coming from you well thank you very so- much so, sorry, sorry, ruining the whole moment there. Yeah, with that. thanks, thanks for that. Sorry please, about that. But... I'm, I'm, good, I'm good for that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you have a moment that needs to be ruined. Oh, I'll get right on that. <laughs> hey, he's can't tell you guys are married at all. <laughs> no, no. no. Nah. It's, it's all an act for the show. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> we can't stick to each other. All right, so we're just going <laughs> to jump right into the conversations if you're or uh, questions rather if you're <laughs> with us already here. You have been open and honest about your past and that you're a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. Uh, why was it so important for you to come forward with your story? Well, it's a it's a good question actually. Initially, I wasn't. Um, I wrote a few books, a few humor, humor books, actually, uh, back in 2011 and 2012, and they did quite well on Amazon, uh, reached number one on a few lists. And then I felt like it just wasn't right. It just wasn't a good fit for me. And... Um, I started writing more poetry. I'd always written poetry. I've been a writer since I was 10 years old. And I found that there was just something in me that really wanted to deal with the fact that I had carried this weight and this burden my whole life. And there really was a um, a factor that hit me which was the death of, well, by suicide of um, an ex-love. And I started delving into some journals. I have been a journal keeper pretty much since I was a, a preteen, almost the same age that I started wanting to be a writer. I started keeping diaries and journals all the way throughout my whole life. And so I started looking back into those journals from when I was in a relationship with him in my uh, early 20s. Mm -hmm. And once he died, it really just opened up this flood of emotion for me. And I started looking back at a lot of the uh, behaviors that I experienced. And, And now that I was older, at the time I was in my 40s when he died, mid 40s, um, a lot of what I experienced, anxiety and depression, uh, I didn't know that's what I was experiencing at the time. And a lot of it made sense to me now that I was much older. And so I was really able to have a different perspective and understand what I was going through. And I just started just 
the whole story really just kind of, you know, came flooding out. And I, I talk to authors and survivors a lot about writing what scares you and really mm-hmm. digging deep inside and, and just letting that first draft come out of you. And it doesn't have to make sense. You don't need to really worry about who's going to read it because at that time, nobody, nobody was watching me. I didn't even know I was going to create a book out of it. I just needed mm-hmm. to get all this out. And so that's really where the initial spark came from. And then I decided I can't, I can't be the only person who has experienced this. I became much more educated through uh, reading through sites like Rain and the Joyful Heart Foundation that, you know, one in four girls and one in six boys under the age of 18 will be abused. And 90% of, the, the, of their abusers are people they know. And in, in my case, I was 11 years old, and mm-hmm. it was the next-door neighbor. And he was a father of uh, five, five or six kids. And, oh, geez. You know, ev- yeah, and, and people implicitly trusted him. He was a officer in the Army and... Um, people oh boy. had no question. Yeah, people had no question that they could, I could go over, or other kids could go over to their house, and we would all be fine. Um, and obviously, that was not the case. So yeah, that re- that really violates a level of trust. Mm-hmm. Very much so, um, but you wouldn't think so. And it's so common that ninety percent of the people, the children that are abused, know their abuser. So the whole you know, stranger danger that as parents we teach our children beware of strangers it kind of flies out the window <laughs> because yeah. it's really people that we know, just teachers and religious leaders and coaches, especially as we know now what that was going on with, you know, all the Olympic athletes and right. the gymnasts and yeah. And so it's, it's really something that we need to, I felt I needed it to educate myself on, uh, Another turning point for me was when I became a mother and went into really somewhat of a deep postpartum depression um, Mm -hmm. because I was terrified and so anxious as to how I would be able to take care of my child. And I had a girl, and this was 18 years ago. I can't believe she's going to be 18 in July. And... (laughs) Um, I can't believe you're I old enough just, to have an 18 year old. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you. I'll be, uh, I just turned 53 <laughs> actually, but thank you. You're my best friend. And um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's honestly hard to believe, you know, <laughs> thank you. Thank but, you. Uh, you're so kind. Um, but yeah, I just completely freaked out. Cause I, at the time was working um, for a corporate job for and marketing for big pharma and I had you know six weeks off after she was born and I just completely lost it you know having to hire a stranger to take care of my kid and I I became a mess and that's when I started going through therapy and so all of this together really just created this whirlwind of me just needing to get my stories out okay you know and and a big part of I think the survivor, what what the survivors of such uh, situations go through is uh, not only are you having to work through what you've been through and who you should tell or how you should tell people or if people believe you or, you know, if you're going to get any help out of the situation, you also have that added degree, that little, that little, um, you know, voice inside your head that says, if I don't tell, will they do this to someone else? And like you said, the person that was your um, abuser had kids. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure mm-hmm. that in some small part of your brain, you had thoughts of, you know, whether or not it was happening there as well. Well, you know, I was so young when it started. I was 11, and I was terrified. I mean, he threatened me. He threatened my baby sister, who at the time was just a year old. And I didn't know that he was also abusing other girls in the neighborhood. I, I, you know, you live in this bubble of terror. And, yeah. uh, 
you know, it went on for over the course of a year. And, and I, I go through, I go through the not explicit details, but I go through, you know, what the, uh, some of the some of the details, but I don't go into you know some of the sexual stuff because I I really was conscious of not wanting to trigger other survivors when I wrote right. the book is right. uh, the first book is is titled Broken Pieces, and it's on Amazon um, in both ebook and paperback and um, so I go into you know the, the course of that and then the the I didn't actually come forward until I because I was so terrified. Um, until I was questioned by Sheriff, who apparently one of the other mothers of one of the much younger girls, I think she was four or five, uh, discovered some kind of physical evidence. And so she called the police and they came and questioned all of the kids in the neighborhood. And I initially said no, but I, I think that they could tell that, you know, kids are terrible liars. We really are. I have an 11 year old son and I know when that boy is lying, he is, uh, he is just a terrible liar. And so they came back and they talked to me again and I, they had to reassure me that I was safe and that my family was safe because I really, I mean, the man had a gun, you know, and he showed it to me and I, I was very, very fearful for a good reason. And yeah. so they had to reassure, reassure me that I was safe and that if I told that nobody would die and, and the, all that. And so I did, I was um, the oldest girl that he had abused and I was able to testify against him. And wow. um, yeah. And so I did, I testified in both a civil and a military trial and ultimately he got all of two years. So it's ridiculous. Yeah. And but the most ridiculous part of all that was well, of course the sentencing. Um it ended up being a, a civil trial because the, they felt there wasn't enough evidence to go for a criminal trial. Um but that my folks, you know, we we've talked about this. They they right. admit I have a very good relationship with my parents and they were very supportive of me writing this book. But they admit, you know, they neither of them were college educated. They, this was the '70s. They didn't really understand the need to put me in therapy or to move us away from that situation, and so they stayed there. And so he came back. I went to school with his kids, and so my, uh, you know, anxiety and depression and and truly the PTSD really just you know, developed and, and their way of dealing with it was just to tell me you're fine. It happened, yeah. but you know, get over, get Sweep over it, it under the rug. Yeah. 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 You know, it, he gets two years for something that you have to live with for the, the rest, rest of, of your, your life. life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hey, Rachel. So I, I know you, you briefly mentioned this. How old were you again when you first sought help for what you had actually gone through? After the birth of my daughter and I was, 35 when she was born so okay yeah dec- decades so you, went, later. you went, went through it alone for a long time yeah and i never talked about it yeah wow wow i i'm i know i speak for beck when i say i'm so sorry that you went through that absolutely i hate well, that for you. you yeah thank you you know thank no you. worries should have to, really... to suffer through that Thank you. I was just really under the impression that I was just going to move beyond it. I was successful in my job. I was a straight A student. I just really went to, you know, survivors show different ways of dealing mm-hmm. with, you know, the, the abuse. Some go heavy into uh, promiscuous behavior. Some go into addiction. Some go deep into depression. I had my own Um, anxiety and depression but I was never treated for it and that was part of not understanding my behavior and what I was going through Um, you know to me that was life that's what I understood it to be right having nightmares and flashbacks that was just part of life Um, now I understand the hypervigilance was a big part of it for me you know jumping at every little sound and then having a panic attack about it uh, that was just part of what I did that to me that was 
I didn't understand that that could be treated. I had no idea. Right. Um, but I went into that perfectionist mode where if I, I became an athlete, a uh, gymnast, and I couldn't just be a gymnast. I had to go out for the varsity team as a freshman and get my letter. <laughs> like that just, I, ha- I had to go 100% and, and re- achieve it. You know, I had to get right. straight A's. You know, I had to, you know, uh, finish college in exactly four years and, you know, get that pharmaceutical job right out of college. And, you know, I just had to keep achieving. And I, I do have a degree of that even now because I can't just, you know, write an article and have it be, you know, I just can't let things go. They have to just be um, perfect. And if it's not perfect, it bothers me. And so I'm working on <laughs> on the perfectionistic tendencies. Um, but that is very common for survivors because it's, it's a control issue. And I didn't right. have mm-hmm. that control. Some people have eating disorders, um, self-esteem issues. All those are very, very common for me and other people as well. And yeah. uh, migraine, that's a huge issue as part of the uh, PTSD. And a lot of people don't associate migraines with survivors or with PTSD, huge, very common. Yes, I, I, as you know, <laughs> have migraines, um, and I also have PTSD. So it's 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 not a shock to me. Um, it, what baffles me is is how they will um, suddenly out of nowhere increase in frequency, and mm-hmm. then maybe I'll go three weeks and not have one at all and then suddenly I have 10 of them in 15 days that's mm-hmm. always been baffling for me but yeah. <laughs> it's a whole nother uh, a whole nother show there <laughs> so, so um, yeah. I, gotta, I gotta mention this really quick just completely unrelated note because there's a lot going on behind us if you happen to hear noises and or meowing of any kind that's <laughs> Our little fur baby is feeling the need to chime in on the show. Yeah, the cats have been um, doing some sort of um, artistic they're, dance routine behind us on the bed. They're trying to they're trying to conjure rain, I think, for some reason. And it's nice out. I was so I laughing. Really wish they'd not. Uh... I was laughing Go earlier ahead. because I I posted that my cat was doing kitty parkour this morning, so I completely <laughs> yeah, understand. I that, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've got one of those two. Our youngest, she, the stuff that she does is, uh, we don't want to go too much into our cats because we talk about them all the time, but yeah, we just, she's, uh, we got her in 2013 and she's one of those uh, orange cats and she's very, very slim, very athletic, not, the other mm-hmm. two aren't athletic really they're and they're older so they, they're yeah. more chill they, they and, sleep a lot mm-hmm. yeah and the, this, yeah. Just, this one just one is just constantly just on her on the go yeah she doesn't like to be picked mm-hmm. up she and she will bounce off the walls she will bounce off and she can get <laughs> on anything so <laughs> yeah. she was she was just doing some strange <laughs> yeah and of course i turn around and look at her and she's looking at me like what? <laughs> Go back so to anyway. doing what you're doing, old man. Yeah. So anyway, if you hear something strange, that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to go out with Nico, Two Hearts.
Welcome back to Voices for Change 2.0. We are here with Rachel Thompson. And Rachel, how uh, has the diagnosis of PTSD affected you in your adult life? I think more than anything, um, it's helped me understand a lot of the mental health symptoms or, I guess, diagnoses more than anything um, that I was experiencing. Um, I had already been diagnosed with, um, well, I had postpartum, and then they put me on a med antidepressant for that, which helped immensely. I mean, it's like I used to explain that I, I felt like I was living in the gray and that just completely cleared up all the clouds. And I, I, it took a few to find one that worked for me. And I tried going off it and, <clears throat> excuse me, the gray would close back in. So for me, mm-hmm. um, being on uh, an antidepressant just really changed my life. And so I am have no issues being on it, telling people that I'm on it, and um, that it's worked quite well for me. And it's also helped control the anxiety that I was feeling as well. I no, I no longer have panic attacks at all. Um, That's I mean, great. Occasional, That's great. But, but yeah, but not like I used to. Um, what are you taking? So that, what are they? Oh, I take Cymbalta. It's a C Y M B A L T A, and it's a it's a low dose. It's not the lowest, but it's like the next up. And I take it once a day. And then um, I I do uh, I don't take anything else for anxiety at all. And okay. I used to, but I don't at all anymore. And I'm good. Um, with regard to the PTSD, the only real significant uh, uh, issue that I have is the migraines. And as we were just talking about, I found that, and I wrote an article actually on uh, rachelintheoc.com, which is my website and blog, mm-hmm. um, that mm-hmm. I've been through everything. <laughs> I've had <laughs> migraines since I was a kid, but they got very, very bad in my late 20s. And I've tried everything. And having been in the pharma industry, I was able to, uh, I called on neurologists and internists, and I I tried acupuncture, and I tried every med under the sun, and I had, you know, I was able to get samples from my docs and see, you know, the the top people in in the field. And, And eventually, I discovered that worked best for me was Botox. Um, not in the face. It's not a cosmetic, uh, right, you know, right. use. It's um, using having it injected, uh, probably like thirty uh, little tiny small injections on the sides of my head, and it's covered by insurance. If you do it through a neurologist and you can prove that you get a certain number, I think it was fifteen, is what we discussed, um, mm-hmm. fifteen or more migraines a month. And that has helped me more than anything, and it's gotten me off all the various different meds. Although I do take Topamax uh, preventively, and I also I actually also take a a, um, a blood pressure med because that has been shown to have preventive effects as well. Uh, the thing with a migraine is that your your veins and your blood vessels tighten up really tight, and so mm-hmm. when yeah. you take the meds they open up your blood vessels. And so can I, um, when can you, I ask the, yeah, go ahead. The, Botox, yeah. the Botox shots, is that, is it painful? I'm, I'm not, no, I, I'm not, a, no. I'm not a, a pain lover. <laughs> no, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I think I have a pretty high tolerance for pain having dealt with migraines and, and, you know, I, I always say, you know, I had two babies so I can deal with pain. Right. Um, but no, <laughs> yeah. the shots are so tiny. They use these little teeny tiny needles and you barely feel anything. And to be honest, sometimes, and you could probably relate to this, Rebecca, uh, sometimes you're so tight <clears throat> on the sides of your head, at least I am, that's where I get the migraines. Um, mm-hmm. It actually is like a release of that pressure when they inject you. It's almost it's, it's, it's sometimes I'm, I'm like, ah, it feels good oh. because it's so tight when they, where they inject. So, uh, but it takes yeah. about a week to kick in and, but, um, I don't know if I answered your question, but those, no, those, it, just, those are, it just, it sounded like 30 was a lot. 
So, but the it way you're explaining lot. it makes it sound yeah. more of a relief than than yeah. pain. Yeah. So. And, and it's yeah. funny because you know she'll she'll complain about having a migraine, and I'll rub the side of her head, and it it feels like it's swelled. You know, just I'm yeah. rubbing it and it's helping her feel better, but it's like wow, you know. Yeah, you can actually yeah. feel on my head where the migraine is because the blood vessel is swollen. Yep. On my, I can on my totally head. relate. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 okay. a pain. Um yeah. okay, so so here's a question for you. Mm-hmm. In in an effort to have survivors not feel so alone, you began uh hashtag on Twitter, uh hashtag sex abuse chat. Uh, would you talk a bit about that? Sure. Um, I actually registered the hashtag, and it's it's more than a hashtag. It's actually a, a weekly chat. And okay. uh, what I what I found when once I wrote Broken Pieces and I started to write Broken Places, which is the second book, and I released that in 2015, I think, um, is that people just came out of the woodwork and started telling me their stories, um, whether it was in DM, which is direct messages on Twitter, or PM, Mm -hmm. which is private messages on Facebook, or emails, or, you know, blog posts. I wrote uh, wrote very honestly um, on my blog as well and shared some excerpts, and people would leave me these comments. And, uh, I mean, hundreds of people, men and women, and even some some uh, people under the age of eighteen who mm. said, you know, I I need to you know get help, and they didn't know where to go. And I thought, you know, I want to have a place for people to be able to find a community of other survivors because even though each of our experiences is different, the way that we recover is different. There needs to be a place that we can connect with each other. And right. while a number of people, of course, um, there are plenty of organizations like RAIN, which is wonderful. And for mm-hmm. people who aren't familiar, it's RAIN with an extra N at the end, mm-hmm. .org. <clears throat> or, again, Joyful Heart is wonderful as well. Um, okay. Twitter, of course, was exploding. And I thought, you know what, I'll just make this a public chat because I really wanted to take the shame a way that people feel because we did nothing wrong. Um, and that's something that across the board, all survivors that I've ever talked to feel is shame. And I really wanted to remove that. So by making the chat public, it's every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern time. And I wanted okay. to connect with um, a therapist because I'm not a therapist. I don't pretend to play one on TV. Um, but I wanted people to um, feel like they were being guided in a way that even though it's not therapy, we don't pretend to make it therapy, it is a group support kind of chat. We have a specific topic every week. So I connected with Bobby Parrish, and that's P-A-R-I-S-H. And she is also actually a survivor of incest and rape, and she is a um, MFT. So she and I connected, and she's wonderful. She's just one of the best people you'll ever meet, very compassionate. And she's a trauma-trained therapist as well. So, oh, okay, um, cool. She, yeah, so that's really important for somebody who needs to find a good therapist. She'll, I mean, I'm not trying to promote her here, um, but <laughs> one of the things I've, oh, I've learned – one of the things I've learned from her is that if you never um, had therapy and you start it and you're with somebody who doesn't understand what it's like to have been through the kind of trauma we've been through, there are a lot of people out there who just really don't understand or can't, and can't relate. And so um, it's hard to, it's worth it. And it's hard to find the right therapist for you, especially if they're not trauma trained. So it's worth asking if your therapist, is trauma trained. Um, so anyway, um, so every That's week we really meet, we have a know. specific, yeah, we have a specific topic. Uh, for example, um, tonight's topic is about teen dating, violence, and abuse. Last week we talked about eating disorders. So we have a very specific topic, and 
the chat is public. If people are are just so uncomfortable that they don't want to participate, they can just follow along. Um, mm-hmm. okay. And then we post all of our chats in a summary. It's called a Storify, um, S-T-O-R-I-F-Y, over on our public Facebook page. So if people can't make the chat or if they're not even on Twitter, they can just go over to facebook.com slash sex abuse chat and look in the notes and they can just catch up that way. Oh, that's oh. a very interesting feature. Yeah, that's very I cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. So now you have written uh, Broken Pieces and Broken Places, and soon you'll be releasing Broken People. Uh, would Correct. you like to tell our listeners a little bit about your books? Sure. Um, what, like I said, when I first started writing it, it just kind of poured out of me in the form of essays and poetry. And that I didn't plan it to be that, that way, but that's just <laughs> kind of how it came out. And sure. I worked with my editor, and she's like, I love it. Let's just go with this. And the first book, we um, – I didn't want to present it in a chronological order. It was kind of going back and forth between what I experienced when I was younger and then what I experienced as a mother and then more in my relationship with the uh, ex-love who died. And then, you know, just kind of back and forth. and, um, And the title was Broken Pieces. And so it really... I we decided in that book we wanted people to kind of experience that discomfort that I felt. And so it was a bit disjointed, but that was intentional. Okay. <laughs> so it was kind of essays and then, a, and then a poem and then an essay or two and then a poem. And it's interesting. Some people loved that format and got it. And other people mm-hmm were very upset by it and they said well it's not chronological and so this is not okay with me and (laughs) they got all kinds of you know one stars because of the format (laughs) Um, i have to tell you i am so in touch with you on that because my book was is a memoir and it was based on my blog and it was written like a journal and i have gotten so many complaints about the formatting of the book and how it's not you know a, a story that mm-hmm. you know has a clear beginning and you know middle beginning middle end, mm-hmm. beginning, middle end mm-hmm. and every yeah so I'm I'm so in touch with that with you oh my gosh yeah I've heard that yeah. for years now and you know I'm okay with it because I feel like I created an emotion in them even if it's frustration they felt the same frustration I did going mm-hmm. through all of these behaviors and emotions and not understanding what was going on. So yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah. Exactly. Um, so uh, that's all right. Um, to each their own, everybody, you know, they have the right, this is what I always tell authors and I understand it myself is I don't take it personally. And um, I figure once our work is out there, we're no longer invited to that party. Um, mm-hmm. Just as I can read a book and not like it, People can read my books and not like them too. So yeah, it's all right. The, the thing uh, I'm always yeah. reminded of, I gotta tell you because this is funny. The thing I'm I'm always reminded of. There was a line. This is gonna sound stupid. There was a line in one of the Wayne's World movies of all things where mm-hmm. uh, Wayne is talking about <clears throat> not everybody liking his show, and he says, "Well, you know, not everybody liked Led Zeppelin, you know, and that's what the Bee Gees were for, you know." So, <laughs> Because <laughs> exactly. everybody liked the Bee Gees, you know, and yeah. it just it, it always stuck, kind of stuck with me, you know. I mean, I, you know, I'm a musician, so playing music for the last thirty years, you know, not everybody's gonna like what you do, and the people that do do, and the people that don't don't. And you know, mm-hmm. I saw it with with Beck and her book, and you've seen it with your books, and you know, there are people that are gonna think what you've done is the best thing since sliced bread, and there are people that are gonna mm-hmm. think it's, you know, a steaming pile of you know and uh that's fine you know you, you, you're right you can't take you're it personally not please everybody yeah that's for sure that's what the bgs are for. yeah yeah <laughs> so. i did learn it's, it's a very good point i did learn in the in the second book um i, I feel like i kind of gave in a little bit 
um, to give it a little bit more structure, and I I broke it up into mind, body, and soul. But it okay. fits with what I was writing about. And <laughs> interestingly, it, it's gotten um, all four and five star reviews. I think <laughs> there might be, yeah, I think there might be one three star or something. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, but it definitely overall has done. You know, it's it's interesting. Broken Pieces has way more reviews, and is still the uh, read more. I think that's mm -hmm. it's more identifying to me as a writer. Broken right. Places, um, you know, doesn't sell as well, but it's I I think it's a better written book. I guess um, mm -hmm. it's won more awards. It's you know uh, ranked higher on Amazon. Um, and that's the book that got me signed by my agent and publisher because they really, <laughs> really liked it. Uh, the, they felt the writing, you know, was elevated from the first book. Um, cool. So, you know, you never know uh, what people are going to like. And now I'm contracted with my publisher to write Broken People. And I'm, I'm about probably 8,000 words into that. Wow. And, um, and then I just released... Um, it's it's been on the back burner because I wrote the thirty day uh the Bad Redhead Media thirty day book marketing challenge and I just released that in December, right around Christmas. So that's been mm -hmm. out now, you know, about three months. And it's it's doing quite well. Yeah, I actually have it myself. So Yeah. Um oh, I started I, I started doing some of the uh tasks the other day I changed up my Twitter profile a little bit and um oh, cool. if I hadn't been yeah if I hadn't been sidelined by my headache for several days in a row I would have gotten to a lot more so I'm excited to see what else uh that book has to offer thank yeah. you well you I, know uh, it says 30 days but you know you don't have to do it every day so <laughs> <laughs> that's good no, uh, nobody's going to, you know, be standing over your shoulder going, you missed today. <laughs> Certainly not me. Uh, you, <laughs> you, don't, you don't know me very well, do you? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm I not, know. I'm not I know. stand over her. No, I, she knows all right, I, all right, all right, all right, all right. Anyway, um, you actually, you mentioned Bad Redhead Media. Um, tell us about that. That's your, your uh, business side, your... Uh, social media mogulness, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, tell us about that, please. Okay, sure. Um, well, I started, um, you know, I started my, in the business world working for Big Pharma um, back in 1989, I guess. Wow. And, um, working doing sales initially and then marketing and training and advertising. I moved back East and worked in the home office. <coughs> Excuse me. And I actually did that for about 17, 18 years until I just couldn't sell my soul to the devil anymore. And <laughs> then I quit when I was trying to conceive my second child and just the stress level was so high and I ended up quitting and within a couple months I got pregnant. So there you go. Shows you yeah. how stress can, can affect you. And I had yeah. my son in 2005 and within probably six months I was like, okay, I've got to do something because I just can't just do this. Um, and so I ended up starting to focus on my, more of my writing and I was helping mm -hmm. my husband at the time, my ex-husband now, uh, with his business, primarily doing, um, editing and, and things like that. Cause he was just terrible with anything having to do with English or grammar or any, he's, you know, born here. He's just terrible with that stuff. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So um, eventually Shocking. I started a blog. Yeah. Um, I started a blog <laughs> and started writing, and, and, and I got a few professional writing gigs, little stuff, you know, writing for the local examiner and things like that. And um, I, I really saw the potential in marketing my own work, and, and self-publishing was just becoming a, a really big deal and was kind of in the Wild West days 
uh, where kind of anything goes. Mm -hmm. And so I connected with some people online and we formed kind of a collective of, you know, I would focus on social media and someone else would focus on formatting and somebody else would focus on graphics. And so we all kind of help each other get our first books, you know, published. And that's when I, I published my first book was in 2011. And um, so I really, well, actually I kicked up, yeah, it was 2011. And I did that and I realized through helping all these other people that I was putting all of my marketing skills to work that I had learned over the years in pharma. And I realized that, Um, how I wanted to treat people based on what I had learned all those years. And it's really what's called relationship marketing. And Mm -hmm. that's really how I decided I wanted to create my own business. And I found that I was volunteering and giving away my time while I was taking care of my kids. And I needed to start charging money um, because I needed to help pay some bills. And so I hung out my shingle and, you know, uh, created my, you know, my DBA, my doing business as, and Mm -hmm. I needed to come up with a name and, you know, known for the red hair. So I thought, well, (laughs) you know, let's make it a media company. Um, But I didn't just want to focus only on social media. I wanted to also focus on the branding and marketing aspects because that's a lot of what I did in my professional life as well. Uh, okay. Well, you know, sales too. So I thought, okay, let's call it media. And so that Bad Redhead Media was born. And I think my first clients were, you know, some indie authors. And I think I maybe charged like $30 an hour or something very affordable, kind of what a virtual assistant would charge. And I did that for a good probably a year, um, just to kind of get my feet wet, made sure I had the experience and I knew. I mean, I knew what I was doing already, but I took some courses and and really just built up my portfolio to the point where I was really comfortable doing what I was doing. And again, those perfectionistic tendencies kick in. So, you know, if I needed to learn how to do something, I took, instead of taking one or two courses, I took 10, you know. (laughs) Um, You're going to do it. You're going to do it. Yes, exactly. But I went to a lot of conferences. Um, I went to BEA, Book Expo America. And um, I mean, I just sat in on everything and just really absorbed a lot. And then, of course, I I marketed my own books and was able to really achieve quite a lot of success that way. And, you know, hitting Amazon number one on a number of lists, the paid list. and, 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 you know, winning awards and just working with some really amazing clients which I can't say who they are, of course. Um, And so I've, uh, you know, I've able, I've been able to really um, cement my reputation that way. And I now am the director of social media for a large website company. And I'm able to work with some New York times bestselling clients. And I still work with indie authors and hybrid authors. And I mean, I love, doing this. And that's one of the things that I just did not love working in corporate. I did not love it. And now I can say, I love writing. I love my business. I can still be here for my kids because I work out of the house. So, you know, it's great. Yeah. It's Well, that's good. Yeah. It's wonderful when you find something that, you know, you enjoy and it's rewarding for you like that. That's always an, an amazing feat because not everyone can find that, unfortunately. Amen to that. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, they say if you and find was, things that, yeah. something you love doing, you don't work a day in your life. So. Yeah. yeah, and I was there. I mean, I would carry that bag into doctor's offices and I'd be met by, you know, some high school kid going, do you have donuts? And I'd be like, are you serious? I went to college for this. No. Yeah. So I used I to was work there. in a couple of I used to work in a couple of different um doctors offices in varying you know, all different all different types of fields and um uh, sometimes I did medical billing, sometimes I just answered the phone and we always knew when the um drug reps came, you know, because they always brought food and you know, mm-hmm. you know the whole the whole lobby would stink for like <laughs> for 
for, for mm-hmm. the entire day, and everybody, everybody that came in would walk in and be like, "What do you guys? What? What? What's it what, smell like in do here? Do you guys have Jimmy John's? <laughs> what? You know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it was funny. It, and and sometimes I know because you guys didn't always get the best um, treatment. You know, it, because mm-hmm. I've I've seen it. I I saw. I've seen how receptionists deal with you know drug reps and i know that they didn't always get you know the most respect that they should have gotten so yeah but yeah i i know uh, i've go ahead ahead. oh i was gonna say i know there were reps that were very pushy and aggressive um and Mm -hmm. so they probably got tired of dealing with reps too so you know it was a two-way street but yeah i that got old (laughs) yeah (laughs) Well, we are uh, running running out of time with you, unfortunately, today. So we're going to jump ahead to a, uh, we're going to skip over a couple of questions that we had and jump ahead to one that I feel is important uh, for us to get out. And that is, uh, what would be your advice for someone that has recently come to terms with an abusive past and where should they go first for help? You know, I get this question probably daily from people. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I always suggest that that people, you know, write down what you can remember, um, even even if it just happened, because we forget things very quickly. Uh, mm-hmm. So write down everything that you can remember, and um, don't worry about who's going to read it. Like I said, nobody's watching you at this moment, or who might believe you, or who might not. So just just get it down. Don't self-edit or anything. Um, and then I would suggest um, finding a very good therapist. Do whatever you need to do wherever you're living. If you're not sure what your resources are, again, go to rain.org. They have a wonderful website. They have a 24-hour chat feature online, or you can call them. I mean, they truly are available 24-7. Um, if you're a man and you just aren't comfortable um, going to rain, although they will help men, of course, or teenagers, um, or even kids um, who might be in need of help, you can go to mm-hmm. rain or joyfulheart.org. Um, but if you're a man, there's a male specific site called one in six.org. It's the number one, and then the letters I N one in six.org and it's specifically for men who have been abused and it's a wonderful site as well so go to either any of those sites for resources and they will help you find someone in your area and um, they'll help you with insurance issues and and the other thing that's very interesting and not a lot of people know this in the united states every county has a mental health clinic and you can go, you can just Google mental health clinic in my county and put in your county. And mm-hmm. you can pay on a sliding scale based on what you can afford. Mm-hmm. And that is, that is mandated by every, uh, I think it's a federally mandated program, but it's definitely mandated by the state. So, <clears throat> excuse me, based on your taxes, if you can bring in your tax statement and say, this is how much I made, and this is what I can afford to pay, and that's all you'll pay. Or that's they'll very offer cool. it free, that's... yeah, based on, it, like if you're on Medi-Cal, then it's free. So um, get help, because you don't have to go through this alone. So that's my other point. And if you need to report it to the police, uh, a gal the other day said, I, I don't know what the process is to report it, and I'm terrified that if I report it, then my abuser will come after me. You can always just call the police and say, I'm afraid to report it, but I want to know what the process is. They're not going to come over and like arrest you. You didn't do anything wrong. Right. Um, mm-hmm. They're very compassionate. They can be, they can be very compassionate. So you can just call them and say, you know, here's what happened. In her case, it was quite brutal and I'm not going to go into details, but um, right. They'll want you to report that, but they can't make you. Okay. So you yeah, can at that's... least just call up, or uh, you know, or have a friend come over, hold your hand, have some support there. Right. Those are all very, very good 
good uh, resources. I'm glad that you. Uh, I'm glad that I got that question in because I really thought feel like people, you know, sometimes are, just feel all alone in this situation and just don't know where to turn. So those are always all valuable resources. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, really quick, Rachel, before we let you go, uh, you have an mm-hmm. extensive social media presence. Would you like to take a moment mm-hmm. to list all of your links, hashtags, etc. That you got going on? Sure. If you um, are looking for my author account, and just go to my website. It's rachelintheoc.com, R-A-C-H-E-L, in the OC, which stands for Orange County, because I used to live there mm-hmm. for almost 20 years, rachelintheoc.com. And mm-hmm. um, I'm the same on um, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook is Rachel Thompson author and for uh, bad redhead media, just like it sounds like a redhead, bad redhead media and Twitter and Facebook and website and Instagram is all the same as well. And then you can just go to Amazon to find my books. And if you have any questions, hit me up at any of those places. And you have, aside from the hashtag sex abuse chat, you ha- don't you have a hashtag uh, Monday blogs? Am I? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. I started Monday blogs back in 2012. So gosh, five years now. Um, because oh. I wanted people to have a way to share their writing without it being promotional because people are constantly hawking their books on Twitter and I was like so over it. So I decided let's just share blogs on Mondays. It sounds pretty basic, right? So just put in the hashtag Monday blogs and share a blog post on a Monday. And for some reason people get really confused by that, but that's all you need to do is just (laughs) share a post on a Monday and use that hashtag. It's not to promote your book or your porn video, or your, you know, um, picture of your cat, although I do love cats. Just, yes. you, you know, if you have a blog post about your cat, then great, use Monday blogs. Otherwise, don't use the, don't use the hashtag. <laughs> but if you go to Bad Redhead Media or Google what is Monday blogs, you'll find out all about it. Um, or okay. you can just go to um, Monday Blogs, the at Monday Blogs, because I own the handle as well, and it has all of the information on there. And then I also started um, Book Marketing Chat, which is every Wednesday at 6 um, okay. uh, Pacific Time. And that's free advice for okay. me. I mean, I normally charge 150 an hour, and you got me for an hour. And wow. tomorrow we're actually talking about auto DMs which is very controversial. So we're expecting quite a crowd. Oh, yeah. Wow. I, can, I can only imagine. I won't say what my my thoughts are on that because it would take a while. But <laughs> Oh, I hate them. I can't stand them. <laughs> I, I, I can't stand them either. And, and I accidentally set them up at one point and, uh, you know, I just got con- – I, I wasn't – as savvy as I am now and I got confused about what I was doing and when I realized it was happening I I wrote everybody individually and apologized to them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. feel you there yeah. so yeah. but we yeah. um, unfortunately are out of time with you for today and we have really enjoyed talking to you you've added some uh, very very good ideas, very good resources for our listeners. I, I'm sure people are going to take away a lot from this interview. Uh, and we just, we're really appreciative of you being on the show today. Yeah, we very much appreciate oh, you taking you. the time to talk to us, Rachel. Thank you so much. And well, thanks you for having me mind, on. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it was our pleasure. And we'd love to do it again sometime. So Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, when, when, uh, when Broken People comes out. Yeah. Uh, Give but me give, give me a holler and we'll uh we'll put you on again. But uh if you would do sure. us the honor of staying on the line for just a moment, we're gonna play out with Jay Knight's Living for the Memories. Single 
second that will stand the test of time. Waiting for a moment that will barely pass you by. Don't you want to know what you've been missing? What you've been missing? Second that will stand the test of time. Waiting for a moment that will barely pass you by. Don't you want to know what you've been missing? What you've been missing? us next week as rebecca and joe continue to battle the stigma of mental illness follow us on twitter at voices for change rj and on facebook at voices for change 2.0